Good morning. Hello, welcome to our next edition of the Garden and Country Extension webinar series through the University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension. Today, we have Suzanne Miller Hoover with us from the Payson Community Garden. She's going to be talking to us about winterizing to keep your garden alive, so yay. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but we just had a beautiful, we, it's raining. It's a beautiful day <laughs> in Arizona. So if you're getting this rain, you know, bless the Lord. All right, a little bit about these uh, webinars. They are presented weekly um, by Zoom, 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11 in Arizona. They feature a variety of horticultural and natural resources topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County, Arizona. The recordings are posted at our YouTube channel. So if you go to University of Arizona Cooperative Extension, you'll find the Garden and Country uh, Extension webinar series. And we tend to get everything up the next week. So that's all up to date there. And just know that the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. Today, our agenda, thank you for everybody who joined early and logged in that lag time. Today uh, at 11 here, I'm your moderator, Chris Jones with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. I'm the county agent in Gila County. And Suzanne Miller Hoover is our presenter talking about winterizing, winterizing to keep your garden alive. She'll have about 30 minutes of, uh, of slides or however many she's prepared for us. And then we'll go into our question and answer discussion with Suzanne. I'll help moderate that. Enter your questions into the Q&A or the chat box. And if I may even promote some people to speak with us just to keep it interactive. I've got an evaluation link. I've already put it into the chat box. I'll share that again. And we'll end this call at noon and get off to lunch. Here's our presenter, Suzanne Miller Hoover, Pacing Community Garden. And this is when I change over and let her take over the slides. So. Okay, come on now. That work? Soon as the, there it is. Okay, yep. good. Good morning, everyone. I'm up in Pine, Arizona, and I am sitting down here watching the rain fall. And almost 30 days since we had any rain at all. So I am ecstatic that I can watch them drop. Um, as Chris said, I'm part of the Payson Community Garden. And this is a good time to talk about winterizing the garden because that's what we've been doing down there for the last month and waiting for the garden's last day um, which is this coming Saturday. So all of our gardens will be put to bed and ready to go for um, next year. Okay. And it may not seem like this is the time to um, prepare your garden for next year, but it is. It's, it's, if you want a dynamic growing season next year, you need to replace a lot of things. You need to think about what your garden's going to look like and then get it ready to sit for, for the winter if you're not in a place where you can have a winter garden. So why is winterizing important? Um, a lot of the things that we see, the infected plants, if you leave them in your garden and don't take them out, can reinfect your spring plants. Um, these plants also provide great hiding places for bugs and we already have enough bugs. We don't need them to breed over winter. And you've used up the so the nutrients in your soil, all of the nitrogen and phosphorus and different things like that, feeding your plants all season long. So you wanna get more nutrients in so they can break down and be ready for the plants to use in the spring. Additionally, um, your soil can erode and you can lose the top layer of beneficial bacteria and insects. So we'll talk about how to um, protect that um, first layer of soil. And if you do have 
vegetables that you're going to overwinter. Some of them may need a little bit of protection. Um, and of course, your tools that you've used need to be clean, need some attention because they need to be um, ready to go for the spring. So this time of year, it's a good thing to plan what's going to happen um, in your garden next spring. Because the last thing you want to do when you want to be planting your seedlings and transplanting plants is revising your irrigation and expanding your garden or trying to remember where your plants were when you're rotating crops. So take a little time, think about what you want for the next year. And this is a good time to um, start writing that plan out. But don't be in a hurry to winterize. Some of our vegetables do better if left until after that first frost, they get sweeter, they get um, more tender. So you get a nicer tasting crop after the first frost. So the steps to winterizing the garden is decide which plants you want to overwinter and then clean up. And cleaning up is probably the most important um, step of all, getting rid of the stuff that you don't need um, and making sure roots are gone and those kinds of things. This is also a good time to test your soil. I tested mine and the, the colors on the test solution were so pale that I could hardly see that I had any nitrogen or anything in my garden. So I knew I really needed to beef it up. Adding or any organics that you want to add and then covering up the garden soil, mulching or putting in cover crops at this time and cleaning your tools. So choosing the vegetables for overwintering um, kale, cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. I didn't realize how much sweeter they would be. So I tasted some kale in one of my fellow gardeners um, gardens. And I couldn't believe the difference between the kale that I had eaten even a week before that went after with the kale that I tasted afterwards. It was really, really different and good. So be patient and you'll get sweeter, tender vegetables. And then you also have to know which vegetables will um, survive a harder light frost. Of course, you don't want your tomatoes out there after a frost because they're not gonna survive. So a hard frost is anything from 25 degrees to 28 degrees Fahrenheit and a light frost is 29 to 32 and we've already had a day or two of hard frost it didn't last long but we will have half more I'm sure root vegetables carrots turnips beets um, can be left in the ground unless your ground freezes um, and I've been told in New York, um, a friend of mine that used to garden back there, they used to plant their carrots in the fall. They would come up and then freeze off and then come up again in the spring and they were extra, extra sweet. So we've had a lot of people that plant carrots, you know, this time of year too, because our ground usually doesn't freeze down too deep. Your potatoes planted, they can be left in the ground. Just make sure they're not on the surface. If they're on the surface, you need to cover them really good with um, some type of a mulch or straw or something to keep them from freezing and to keep the sun away from them. 
but a lot of these vegetables in Arizona can stay in the ground. Herbs, I just transplanted my garden. One of my fellow gardeners was redoing her garden, so I took all of her herbs and replanted them in my garden. So the ones that you see here, sage, rosemary, thyme, chives, oregano, marjoram, tarragon, will all survive the winters in zone six or higher. Um, you need to trim them down a little bit, um, put some mulch or straw around them. But all of these, they may look like they have died away over the winter, but they come back in the spring and they come back really nice and full from the haircut that you, you gave them. So don't worry about pulling these out. Things like um, basil, if it's in a pot, you could probably take it inside and it would survive, but it's not going to survive our winters. So now the most important piece, cleaning up your garden space. Remove all the diseased and plants past their time. If they've already given everything that they have to give, there's no use leaving them in your garden. Um, again, it's a place for the aphids, especially over the winter to find a place to overwinter and then you're gonna have aphids in the spring. Um, you wanna remove as many leaves and weeds and roots and other garden debris that have collected over the season and throw it away or better yet, put it in your compost pile so that you have some good stuff for next year. Just make sure you don't put any of the disease plants or weeds in your compost pile or things like um, tomatoes that easily attract disease. Um, the weeds don't die over um, the winter. In fact, they can become stronger and um, harbor disease. So you wanna get rid of them now so that you don't have to battle the old ones next year again. You want to pull out the weeds and plants at getting as much of the root as you can. And if for some reason you have um, a lot of weeds, you can put um, a black plastic cardboard carpet remnants um, down over the top of them and weight it down. And this will kill the existing weeds and stop seeds from sprouting. Um, so you want to do that. Chris and I were just talking about one um, weed that we got in the garden that we're battling and that's the bindweed. And the exercises doesn't kill the bindweed. The best thing you can do is just keep, every time you see one pop, its head through the ground, pull it. And that's the only way to control it. All these other um, things don't work with bindweed. So it may not work with other things, but black plastic cardboard carpet remnants keeps the sun away and, um, and will kill those weeds for you. So now you've got your garden clean, let's talk about um, what we're going to do to um, get your soil ready. So you're gonna test your soil so you know what to put back in it. If you're a no-till gardener, then you're not going to um, do this next step, but a lot of people do. And then they have their garden ready to put manure, compost, and nutrients down on the on this um, garden soil. So you want to turn your soil to a depth of one foot if you're doing this and pull out as many of the old roots as you can as it, as it comes up. Um, the one good thing about this is I love looking at the worms that are still in my soil when I turn it. A couple of years ago, I didn't have a worm one and 
now every time I turn the soil, I have tons of worms in my garden. So that means that I've been feeding them them right. And so now's the time to add your organics and add the mulch on top of that. And the organics can be chicken, horse, cow manure. Um, it can be mushroom compost. There's a lot of things that you can add to your garden right now that are going to feed all of those worms and all of the um, microorganisms that are underneath your, your garden soil. You want them to be eating so that they can um, make your soil nice and soft and get rid of as much of the non-wanted bugs and things. So pH, uh, most of the Arizona soil, especially up here in Payson and Pine area, um, is right around a neutral pH, and that's what, what you want. But if you test your soil and the pH is too high, then you want to add sulfur or aluminum sulfate if it's too low, wood ashes or lime. But the important thing is to talk to somebody like your favorite um, nursery or the um, or Chris's group, anyone that can tell you how much to put in and whether or not you really need to put some stuff in. It does depend on what you're growing, but you don't want to take a neutral soil and make it acidic unless you're growing things like blueberries or things that need an acidic garden because your other plants won't grow as well. Um, the nutrients, you can use a really good um, vegetable fertilizer. Um, try and look for one that has the extra little microbes included. They give your garden a little extra boost. Uh, some people recommend crab meal and it's a slow release nitrogen and phosphorus, calcium and magnesium. Um, helps get rid of those non-beneficial nematodes like the root um, not nematodes that um, are in your garden that need to be um, gotten rid of over the winter and helps you not have um, fungus. It also helps um, the breakdown products of all these nutrients um, to be robust. Other um, nutrients, azomite is something that replaces your natural minerals um, to remineralize your uh, depleted soil. And it helps those root systems in the spring really develop well. So it's a nice natural product. Um, and again, we're talking about uh, organic products that we're putting on um, to keep these gardens uh, growing and not using chemicals if we can help it. A lot of people love um, alfalfa pellets. I know the first year that I was gardening, I knew nothing about the Payson area and I got some alfalfa pellets and I had one of the best gardens I've ever had. Um, it does supply a lot of nitrogen. It's a good soil conditioner and it can help deter those root rot, root knot nematodes that um, show up in your garden. And if you don't know what a root knot nematode is, um, it literally looks like the roots of your plant when you pull it up because it's not doing well. Somebody has come along and tied a bunch of knots into the root system. It's always there. Um, all you can do is um, add stuff to your soil that um, help deter them so that the beneficial nematodes can take over. One of the things that um, 
our resident um, nursery guy has suggested that we put on our gardens is something called Sluggo Pest Plus. It's an organic pest control. And after you put everything else down, you put this on the, um, on the top before you put down your mulch and your um, straw to cover up the garden so that um, it can entice all of these different types of bugs to come up and eat and um, be killed before um, the season, season starts and it will all be gone by the time that the spring comes and it doesn't hurt your um, beneficial nematodes and things. So now it's time to plant your winter garden if you're um, going to add things. Um, I absolutely love to plant garlic and shallots in November. And um, I add them after I've got all my um, amendments in, water them in really well. This is also the time for um, your root vegetables, uh, usually in, um, if you want them to grow over winter, uh, you could plant them now too. One of the other gardens here in town is open all winter. And so they have all of their winter crops growing, but this is a good time to do it. I don't like to leave my garden uncovered in the winter mostly because I don't want that top lev layer to erode and I don't want um, the weeds and seeds that come with the winds to be able to find a spot and start growing. So I use organic mulch, but there's a lot of people that use the cover crops, things like um, Clove, red clover and winter oats and things that will get their roots down into your soil and break it up. And it will also keep the erosion from happening. You're not gonna lose that first layer where all your uh, beneficial microbes and winter worms are and things. And it also, again, gives somebody, gives them something to eat. Um, and, you really want to know what crop is good for your area of the um, country of the state. So again, talking to um, the people that know your area best will tell you which ones to use. We use a lot of winter oats up here. And then of course, your organic, um, mulch and it can be composted manure, it can be straw, it can be just about anything that you want. So winter rye, winter oats, hairy vetch, red clover, these are all good, good choices um, that and some of them are um, nitrogen holding in so you get more nitrogen into your soil to using these kinds of um, winter crops to over over winter. Um, composted manure, a lot of us use. If you look in our garden right now, many of them are covered with straw. We have one lady that saves all of her cardboard all year round and covers up her garden in cardboard. She's our true no-till gardener. And so she uses cardboard carpet pieces. And in, she also puts some cover crops on top of hers. So she has a really, really nice garden um, in the spring to plant with. So, Tools and garden equipment, cleanliness is an essential component. So what you want to do is clean your tools 
to remove all the dirt and grime. You want to sanitize them in a bleach solution to kill bacteria and fungus, especially if you found that you have root knot um, nematodes that are attacking your, um, your plants. You want to make sure that you clean your tools with a bleach solution and let it dry before you use your tools in a different part of your garden. Um, repair any tools that you're not going to use that need repair. Put oil on them that will stop the rusting and then put them in a good place until spring. So if you do these things, your tools are all going to be ready and you won't have to be cleaning them and trying to get the rust off in the spring when you should be planting your garden and playing in the dirt. So to recap, this time of year is good for deciding when your plants can remain, which plants will remain in your garden and which plants you need to take out. Any of your perennials, make sure you know whether they need an extra um, blanket of straw or mulch or something to keep them warm in the winter and keep them growing for spring and really clean your garden of all the debris that's been in it and compost whatever you can compost, but making sure the weeds and things like that um, go in the trash. Test your soil, add your amendments, plant your winter crops, whatever you want to keep growing and make sure you have some type of cover over your garden soil, um, cover crops, mulch, straw, um, cardboard, whatever it is that um, you wanna cover your garden with, just make sure that they're not going to erode. Clean your tools and have fun the rest of the season. So Chris, I'm ready for questions. Great. Susan, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. These are all the kind of little details that some of us don't think of and just make sure we cover them. So really excited to get this, to hear what you had to say about what we need to be doing and what we can be doing this time of year. So yeah, let's jump into the question and answer series time. Um, I've got Janet Ortega asking, can you use beet pulp pellets used to feed horses into your compost? I don't know. I've never heard of beet pulp pellets. Um, I would, I'm not too sure. I would wonder if beet pulps would be higher in carbon than it would be in, uh, in nitrogen. And so the alfalfa pellets, which, you know, are going to be nice and green, a lot of nitrogen. I'm not too sure. With, so I think it would just depend on that nitrogen content. Don't you think so? I would think I, you know, because it, um, you really need that nitrogen, but yeah, I, I'm going to have to do some research into beet pulp. Thanks and, for asking. And if you're just putting into your compost pile, well, it just depends on how much money you're having to spend for it. So <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Um, Susan has a couple of questions here. She wants to know in planning your garden, what do you plant together? And how often do you water water in the winter garden? Um, I don't water at all. Um, my garden down at the um, Payson Community Garden, we turn off the water and I just let nature take its course. And over the three, four years that I've been there, I've not had any um, issues with not having enough water. Um, I plant all my root crops together, like the carrots and um, beets and things like that. I put in a couple of rows of different types of garlic. And right next to that, I put in shallots and, and onions and things. So I just kind of put it all in a compact little spot so that I know what I have and can watch for it to 
to start in the spring and make sure things are coming up. Yeah, you're, we're fortunate that in the pace and we tend to get a few winter rains and, you know, often that's enough. So you just, one, one real benefit of growing a winter garden is you use so much less water <laughs> than you do yes. during the summer. So it depends on your elevation and what you're, you're able to do with the plant's water needs. Kathleen Corum has asked, what is the difference between mulch and garden debris? I think you talk, mentioned it earlier on in your talk. Yeah. Um, garden debris is um, those things like boards or rocks, um, leaves that um, are moldy. Um, some of the things like the leaves and things you can put in your compost pile and they will break down. Um, you can turn, turn them in. You just need to make sure that they're not diseased when you're doing it. Um, a lot of people will turn in, um, I use wood chips as a cover during the summer to keep my garden moist. And I turn those in or I just pull them off to the side and put them over the top during the winter. You just don't want anything that is um, diseased to go into it. So a lot of people think of composted steer manure, straw, that kind of thing for um, covering your garden. Good. Um, and this was something that I thought of. Where, down here in Globe, where I live, hen's bit grows in the with the winter rains in my yard and garden. What do you think of it as a cover crop? Are you familiar with hen's bit? I am not. It's a, a winter annual. It's got a little purple flower. It doesn't get too tall. And it does die back when the, when the heat comes on in the spring. Um, it's, it's got a kind of a strong mat that it creates with its roots. You know, I have to break that up and get it back in the soil. But I know it doesn't fix nitrogen. I mean, but it, but it does create a little organic matter. And it's, it's the weed rather than weeds I have to pull. So, yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you're not familiar with it, it's just something that grows down here. Carol Kiefer asks, would you mind showing the slide again? Oh, we'll have to pull this back up. Slide again that shows the crops, which crops grow during the winter time, including, it included rutabaga, bega, I believe. So go uh, ahead and go okay, back I'll to go find screen it. And bring that back up. And while you're working on that, I'll go through a few more of these. Pat Fotica shared that she uses shredded paper as mm -hmm. mulch. That's excellent. Um, Karen Urain, Carol Urain asks, can you, can you include elk droppings in the compost? We have plenty of it here in pine. <laughs> yes, so we do. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, it's, it's, I don't know. I see no reason not to use elk droppings for compost. Okay. Yes. It's all green. It's all yep. natural. It should be. It should be very similar to using horse manure. Yeah, unless of course you've got elk like I do that get into the bird feed and eat all the bird seed, and then you're <laughs> going to have that possibly growing in. But um, one thing, and and so by that I would treat it like horse manure. Mm -hmm. Gather it up, put it in a corner, let it weather for six months or so so that all of the the urines and you know those types of uh hot uh nitrogen has enough time to kind of filter out and then work it right into your compost i i don't see any problem why not okay i'm gonna steal your screen for a minute and show this slide that she asked for is it i don't okay here it comes there it goes good so carrots, beets, turnips, rutabagas, parsnips um, can all grow. And also, I even put potatoes in the ground this year to overwinter to see if I could get a earlier crop of potatoes. And in Arizona, you should be able to um, grow potatoes year round. So... I see in your picture you have fennel and it does fine through the winter at my mm -hmm. elevation down here in Globe. Yeah. So 
potatoes, carrot. I just started all the different types of garlic last year and just, I was so sad when I used it all up and I even used up the stuff I'd put away to start my garden with this year. So I had to buy more. <laughs> it wasn't a smart thing to do, but it was so good. And you so. might've mentioned this, but when do you start those uh, winter vegetables such as carrots and beets? Do you put those in, in August, September? When do you start? Actually, actually um, so that we get um, a good enough um, growing season, we're starting to put them in um, in June, wow. June and July, um, especially things like broccoli and um, those other ones, um, let's see, that have to grow and um, the cabbages, the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts. Unfortunately, this year, people put them in in August and they weren't able to get a crop out of them by this weekend. So if you put them in earlier, that gives you a better chance to get something before our garden closes. Although I would think that in other places where you have access to your garden, um, August is usually when Glenn suggests that we put these kind of crops in. But you, you think that when that monsoon, when the monsoon starts, if, if we get one, not like this, mm -hmm. yeah, um, then that would be a good time that it cools off enough and these plants get started and work well. Yes. And then if you're able to cover them and keep them going through the winter, you've got crops through the winter, so. Correct. Great. Okay. All right, more questions coming in. We're, I think I, we're gonna go right up to the end here. Go, I'm sorry, okay. we can add. Okay, if you had powdery mildew on the squash leaves, for instance, what can you put into the soil to avoid that the next spring's crop? Uh, good question. Um, I'm not sure, Chris, do you? I would say if I got powdery mildew, I would dispose of those leaves. Right so that you're keeping that population down. And powdery mildew just likes a lot of moisture, humid weather, um, shade. And so easy in Arizona to have to not have shade and, and too much moisture to wear. Hopefully the next year that powdery mildew won't won't come back again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't annual crops. Yeah, I um, didn't do anything but remove my um, cabbage that I had or and some squash that I had that got it and I haven't had it since but I had it one year because I over planted and there was too much shade too much shade and, mm -hmm. and, and then just sanitation okay yes. that was from Diane Thornburg and to now Bev Wilcox asks I'm not sure if you can speak about pear trees and roses a little off topic here. She planted three, only one looks like it's gonna make it. Do I water with five gallons once a month during the winter? How much to, so, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, this was just a really bad year and you just, they just required a lot more supplemental water than what was normal. Looking at that question. Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I don't have pear trees. I've got one rose, so I'm not a good person to, to ask about that. And Bev, I would say that uh, your five gallons once a month during the winter is, is a good idea. Fortunately, today we're actually getting some rain, um, but it's predicted to be another droughty winter. So if you go a month and you don't, we don't get any rain, they put, add some water to that root to that root system. And same thing with those roses, maybe once once a month, same type of thing. Um, Kathleen asks, are you able to get root crops to germinate at this time of the year? I was told that marjoram was not winter hardy here. Does it winter overwinter for you? Yes, marjoram 
does. In fact, that's one that um, I just transplanted a plant that had been growing for eight years in my friend's friend's garden. Um, so she's never done anything um, but let it grow and put it next to some other herbs so it gets protection from the wind and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And what was the other? Um, germinating? germinating root crops at this time. Um, I've not tried, but I have friends that have just done a second planting um, up here. And so I'm waiting to see what happens with their crops. I think the important thing with that is having a cover, putting some mm -hmm. plastic or something on top of it to help warm the soil and get those to come up. Um, they're not going to grow fast, but they may come up. And then they'll at least you'll have a, a head start when it starts to, to warm up in the spring. And in the Globe Miami area, 3,500 feet, marjoram, oregano, all over winter very easily. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, easy plant. Um, what about nettles? What about nettles? Um, nutrition, nutrient value as a cover. So I don't think we use nettles in Arizona. What mm -mm. have you heard? I've not heard anything about using nettles. So. Yeah, so that's maybe another another state where we have nettles, but we don't really deal with them here. And we, I would not want to have nettles if I don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so do you water garlic? So again, it just matters on how much moisture you have in your soil. So what do you think about watering? Uh, I water it in really well when I first plant it and until my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, until my, um, the water is shut off and then um, I don't water it again until spring and then I water it once a week. What I know about garlic and shallots and those kinds of things, you wanna water it really well while it's putting down roots. You want it to have enough nutrients and moisture to put down a good root crop set of roots so that the bulb can grow. And then the closer it gets to um, when you're picking your garlic, you want to slow down on, on the water so that it has time to um, make those bulbs stronger for you to pick. Okay, good. And also asking, do you remove Swiss chard or let it over winter? And I think that's going to be kind of a elevation thing and whether mm -hmm. it's looking healthy or not. Yeah, because if it's not looking healthy, it's an awesome place for aphids to overwinter. So you really don't want to leave it in if it's not healthy and um, or if you start seeing some aphids go towards it, you want to get it out of there. I tend to take all of that out of my garden. Yeah, and, and but I, on the other hand, I can imagine it overwinter well, depending on how cold it gets. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to keep on picking it, but if, but if it gets aphids, yeah, it needs to come out. Okay, Janet Ortega asked, do, can you recommend a kit to test the soil or do you send it off to get it tested? <laughs> Actually, I've done both. Um, what we have used this year um, was the simple one that uh, you can get at any of the big box stores like Home Depot. It has pH, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, I forgot what the other one was, but it's, it's an inexpensive one where you just take your soil out of a soil sample out of your garden and mix it with water and then you use the the water of that mixture to test and we did a thing where um, the guy from our local um, nursery tested several gardens throughout our garden to see what the soil 
was like because we had not done a lot of things in the last year. Each person is doing their own thing. And he tested it and got and sent it off. And um, it was about $50 a, um, a garden for one um, test to be done or one set of tests to be done. And what we found was that those little inexpensive things from the big box stores um, are almost as accurate as the other one. He had tested my garden and it was almost exactly the same. So I don't see why you would uh, you know, need to go for the more expensive one unless um, you're just starting and don't know at all what's in your garden and want to really beef it up. Chris? Um, I, I agree. The soil and water testing in Arizona is done by private companies and it can get very expensive. And so unless you are really running into a problem that's like, I can't fix this, what's going on, then I would definitely say use those kits you can get at the hardware store and use that as just kind of a guide. A lot of times the plants are gonna tell you what they need. Mm -hmm. And when the plants are starting to get the problem that you can't resolve, that's when it would be worthwhile to spend some more money on a soil test. Sound good? That sounds good. All right. Richard Ryan, manure that are pellet in form like deer and so on are not hot and can be added straight right out of the animal. Wow. wow. Deer and elk are eating all the local native plants, especially beneficial. So Richard Ryan says, thumbs up on using deer and elk, rabbit, goat, all that type of manure. How cool is that? Yeah. And Harriet Jack asks, do you have to do something special for your asparagus beds in the winter? Ah, good question. Um, asparagus likes to be cut off below the ground and then more dirt, um, your mulch and stuff piled over the top of that. So I cut it down as close to the surface or sometimes I dig around it. <clears throat> ah voice is going here. Sorry about that. Um, and cover it up. Excuse me just a minute. We'll give you a moment for a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> My coffee isn't doing it. That's terrible. Um, but yeah, you want to uh, just make sure it's um, good and covered up so that um, all the nutrients that it's pulled in during the fall months will um, will go right to the crown so that you have good crops the next year. You want to do the same thing with um, rhubarb. Um, cut it down and, you know, you stop um, harvesting rhubarb about in August, middle August, so that all the nutrients can go into the crown so that you have a better plant next year, but cut it down and cover it up. Okay. Um, Rachel Hendrickson asks, how much rain at a time is enough to avoid watering in the winter? That's a good question. Is 0.10 enough or do you need at least an inch? Um, I'll go ahead. You want to you want to take, take this? I'll try also. Um, part of my thing is get yourself a uh, moisture tester or dig down into your garden to see how moist your your soil is before you worry about um, watering. Um, that would be my first clue. Chris? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of what ifs. On, a, on that. So if you dig into the ground and you can see that it's dry, it's going to need some more water. And, you know, just depending on how warm it's been, how dry it's been, you know, a tenth of an inch may not be doing it. But if, if it's been coming once up every couple of weeks, then, or, or, or twice a week, then you, we can get any tape. So yeah, just check that water, put a shovel in there, see how, how moist it is. Um, so Gwen, who has the nettles, say they come up in the Sedona area. 
So Gwen, oh. if those are stinging nettles, I would put on my gloves and pull them out and try to get rid of them. <laughs> I wrote, I'm not too sure which type of nettle we're talking about. Mary Barnes adds, Texas A&M test soils for a very reasonable cost. Oh, nice to know. And I've got a request to copy the address of the YouTube site. John, I'll put that in there in just a moment. Let me check some other questions here. Um, I think we're up to date on our questions here. John, let me find that. And I'll dump that, put that right in there. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of um, information coming from the university um, master gardeners and their whole gardening program. And you notice, Chris, I am drawing a blank on what you're called. Um, university of Arizona Cooperative Extension. Cooperative Extension, that's what it is. You know, holds a lot of information for gardening around the state and knowing um, what's really, really good overall in your area and, you know, getting to know your nursery man, like we have one up here in Payson that has been here forever. And if he can't answer our questions, um, we know we're in trouble because Glenn has been around for so long and he's part and parcel of a lot of the information that we get and identifying different bugs and things like that. So really get to know those people in your area that know um, what grows well and what overwinters well. Um, and they'll be your greatest um, source of information. Great. Well, we're starting to wind down on the questions. Well, maybe one. Um, okay, Susan's asking, in planning for the spring, what plants do you plant together and which do you keep apart? So she's a little bit okay. of your companion planting. Um, I wonder, I don't know that I have it sitting right here with me. Um, I do have a list of um, companion planting. Um, some people don't like to do potatoes and tomatoes together because the potatoes bring on the bugs, but I have done that and not had any, um, any issues um, aside from an occasional potato bug getting on my tomatoes. I like to plant a lot of herbs with my tomatoes because the bugs don't don't like them. Um, Chris, I know you have probably have a list of companion plants. I know Glenn gave us one. Um, are we going to do a companion class? I think it's sometime later in the year we may have a discussion on that. So okay. Yeah. All right. So at this time I'd like to put your attention towards the chat box. I did put in the link to the YouTube channel that you can scroll through there and see which ones are of interest and look at those. And ask again to please fill out a brief evaluation after the webinar. So that uh, website there will bring you to a really short um, evaluation that'll just ask a few questions for you and help me out with showing some impact to these programs and what else, how else I can improve it. So. At this time, I'll bring up my slides here just to close it down. Uh, here's Susan again. Thank you very much. You are more than welcome. There's, I, this has just been a lot of fun. We've learned so much from each other. Uh, look for that link I just mentioned in the chat box. We've just had our question and answer discussion with Suzanne. And uh, next week on December 17, going to be kind of a change of topics here for this audience. We are gonna be talking about opportunities and barriers for Arizona to supply wood fiber to South Korean renewable energy markets. And the presenter is Jane DePasquale. He just graduated from uh, Northern Arizona University. This was his, I think, dissertation. 
And he's working with uh, Dr. Han Supan up in uh, NAU that are looking at how can we use bioenergy for the Ponderosa forests we have, which will provide a really good opportunity of uh, forest health and be able to help control some of these wildfires that we're seeing. So important research that they're doing. Please join us if you can. And thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank I'm, you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and see you all next week. See you, Chris. Well, you can hang on for a second here. Oh, okay. I still need to find. There we go.